Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Javar Yishalayim in Harnov, Jerusalem. This is Peya, Chapter 7, Halacha 5, Continued. We're going to be getting in today to finishing up the uh, set of sugyas in the Halacha, and this is part three of the three-part shear. Um, today, we're going to be getting into some of the agadas about this to try to figure out what is Bet Shemai saying. So one of the things is going to come up is what happened when the Jews conquered the land, what is, um, what's going to count for uh, Israel, not Israel. That's why we're talking about Syria. And we're also going to be getting into whether this has uh, Kedusha or not. And uh, we're also going to be getting into how much Kedusha does this have. And um, finally, we're going we're gonna to end. Uh, and the ending, I think, is a little bit surprising. So one of the things to keep in mind with this is that um, you can't really make up Gemaras. You're, you're, you can't make up the Gemaras. The Gemara is what the Gemara is. And the sages wrote this because they thought it was important. We always want to have a preservation where we know what the majority opinion is and we want to know what the minority opinion is. And it's clear that we can't really figure out what is the minority opinion. That's Bet Shammai. What is this really talking about? Bet Hillel is saying that we have a halaha of Moshe Sinai, and it seems, not it seems, it is that Bet Shammai doesn't accept that. But the way that they're proving it uh, is, is a different way. So, for instance, let's say you're proving it with the scriptural verse in Bikurim. So you would say that Bet Shemai still doesn't accept this Halahala Moshe Lassini because they're proving it from this scriptural verse over here. Or let's say that they're saying, no, uh, this is uh, going to be a Gezer Shabbat between holy and holy, between between Meister Shani and Revi'i, and the leniencies are not going, or the leniencies are still going to apply for Meister Shani. There's no Halahala Moshe Lassini, according to Bet Shemai. So you have this this case of these great men sitting here trying to come up with exactly what is the case and the derivation for for Revi'i. And it's important to know what you're arguing against. Everybody agrees that the Halaha is like Bet Hila, but you want to know what is the what is the dissenting opinion and understand how they're deriving it and what does it mean. Now yesterday we were talking about a debate between toward the end of it, with uh, Rabbi Zera and, and Rabbi Bivi. Rabbi Bivi is basically taking Rabbi Yuda's point of view. Basically, one way to read that and interpret it, says the Rashba in the, in the parallel text to this, in the Babli, Baba Kama 69a, Rabbi Bivi's understanding, and this is basically Rabbi Yuda, Rabbi Bivi's understanding, Bet Shemai, to be saying that the comparison between Meister Shani and Revi'i is total, uh, just as there is altogether no Meiser Shani during Shemitah, so too there's altogether no Revi'i during Shemitah. Bet Shemai is picking the case of the fourth year produce on uh, the Shemitah year on purpose, and that's to prove a point. Uh, there's going to be no sanctity either for the Meiser Shani or for the Revi'i. We we know there's no there's no sanctity for Meiser Shani. Meiser Shani is open to everybody. But the point of Rabbi Bivi on the way he's interpreting, and again, it's not Rabbi Bivi's opinion, and it's not Rabbi Zera's opinion. All of this is trying to do is come up with exactly what is Bet Shemai's opinion. And, you know, you have to respect how the sages are handling it, because again, you can't make up the Gemara. The Gemara is what the Gemara is, but the great editor of the Yerushalmi, Rabbi Yochanan, wants to put all of this discussion together so that you can see what the issues are. And, you know, a lot of times Rabbi Yochanan will say that, you know, these are puzzles to sharpen the minds. By forcing us to go through this puzzle, okay, maybe you're still not sure what Bet Shemai's position is, but you're forced to understand Rebbe'i in a much richer, deeper way. You're going to understand what are the implications if it falls on the seventh year, what's going to happen if it falls on the third year, the sixth year, and does it gonna ha- is it going to have sanctity or not? Um, what happens if you grow it in Syria? 
So it's forcing you to walk through and learn a lot about Rebbe E, even if you're not sure what that position is by Bet Shemai. But the point of doing it, I think, by Rabbi Yochanan is to force us to get an, a working understanding of Rebbe E, because, again, I don't think that a lot of people are sitting there studying this halacha that often, and certainly not a lot in depth, and you get a lot of credit in Shemayim for learning this. This is like you having a vineyard and you doing the, the Rebbe E yourself. We know that the Briskarov encouraged everybody to go study the laws of Kodeshim because there's a Gemara that says if, you are, if you're studying the laws of Kodeshim, it's like you're, you're doing it. It's like you're, you're actually doing these, these offerings. So there's a spiritual reason to learn this stuff. There are writings in, in the Midrash about how we're supposed to try to do 613 mitzvot. And then you say to yourself, well, I can't because I'm not a Kohen. Or I can't because I'm not a king. There's, they would counter that. and They would say, no, you can by learning about the laws. And there's really a clue to learn about the laws because you're really supposed to do 613 mitzvot. And you get a special reward in this lifetime if you do that. I believe that uh, one of the uh, Meforshim say that you, know, you don't get stuck with this endless Gilgul cycle of coming back, coming back, coming back to fix things because you're you're actually, you know, living a life where you're learning and you're doing all the mitzvot in the Torah. And you can't do them all. You're not a king, neither am I, but we can do it by learning about it. And that's and that's how you get around it. So that's why it's important. Now, a little bit more about this, you know, to try to understand Bet Shemai's ruling. Rabbi Bibi, who is really Rabbi Yuda, that's really explains the Gezer Shava as an unlimited comparison between Meister Shini and Rebbe'i, and it follows that just as uh, there is no Meister Shini whatsoever in Syria, so too should be for Rebbe'i. Rabbi Zera has a different view, and uh, he's saying that Bet Shemai does not employ the Gezer Shava to teach that there's no Rebbe'i at all during the Shemitah, but only that the laws of a fifth and disposal do not apply to Rebbe'i of the Shemitah because Bet Shemai is taking a limited view of the Gezer Shava and does not embrace a blanket exemption for Rebbe'i of Shemitah. Rabbi Zer is really articulating the opinion of Rebbe, and Rabbi Bivi is really articulating the opinion of uh, Rabbi Yuda. And again, uh, that's not Rebbe's opinion. It's not necessarily Rabbi Yuda's opinion, but it's it's... Uh, again, they're trying to figure out what does Bet Shemai say. Now, the Gemara is now going to talk, and here's what it's going to say. We're going to get back to Rabbi Bibi. That's why I wanted to go over that, because he's going to be talking about Rabbi Yudah's ruling and his interpretation of Rabbi Yudah's ruling. And here's what Rabbi Bibi says. Rabbi Hefa said, uh, Behold, according to Rabbi Bibi, Rabbi Yudah said that the sages derived the law of a fourth-year sapling from none other than the law of Meister Shani, and therefore ruled that just as you say there is no requirement of Meister Shani in Syria, in the same way there is no requirement of a fourth year sapling in Syria. So basically, what they're saying is, according to Rabbi Yuda, what Bet Shemai is saying is that neither is there um, Meister Shani over there in Syria, and there's no Rebbe E. Why? Because these are these are these are agricultural laws uh, for the land, and that basically wasn't according to what they're saying. What Bet Shemai would be saying, they're saying that this was not conquered uh, in one of the wars. It was a it was a discretionary war, and it doesn't have the sanctity that regular Eretz Israel has. So now the Gemara is going to question it, and we're going to get into some of these agadas. But in the same way, says the Gemara, one could argue that since the sages derived the law of Truma, of the Toda bread, from none other than the law of Truma's Miser, through a scriptural analogy between the two, in other words, you have this Gezerah Shava linking the Toda bread for Truma, and also, you know, the law of Truma Miser, the Gemara says, then just as you say there's no obligation for Truma's Miser in the wilderness, in the same way there should be no Truma of Toda bread, the Toda bread, in the wilderness. Basically, it would be saying that there's no Toda offering in the wilderness at all. And we know that you know the Toda offering was able to be brought in the wilderness. So they're trying to disprove this claim by Rabbi Bivi. And so basically what they're saying is this analogy 
you know, between Trumas Mice and this wilderness exemption, they don't accept it. And this is going to contradict or maybe contradict uh, Rabbi Bibby's understanding of Rabbi Yudah's ruling. We had the Toda offerings. Those are the Thanksgiving breads and, the, and offerings that were accompanied. And you brought 40 loaves of bread. There would be uh, 10 halas. Then there would be 10 rakikins. And then there would be uh, 10 uh, revuchachs and 10 loaves of, of hummets. 30 would be matzahs on leaven, and 10 would be hummets. And one loaf from each group of 10 was given to the cone, and the remaining was eaten by the person who made the offering and his guests. And the four are given to the cone as a, a, a truma of a toda. They had to separate out truma for the toda itself. So they're, they're, they have 40, and then they have to take out four from the 40 to give it to a cone as a truma. Okay, that's that's a law of deraita. You can find that in Leviticus chapter seven, pasuk uh, twelve to fourteen. The truma meiser is a tithe that the levy takes from the meiser rishon, and then he gives it to the cone. Uh, Leviticus seven fourteen. It says the Torah is uh, refers to the loaves given to the cone as truma over there, and then if you look in Numbers eighteen twenty six, it refers to the tithe taken from the Meiser Rishon as Truma. So this shared terminology is going to teach a Gezer Shava between the two laws. And over there in the Bavli and Menacho 77b, which is all about the breads, this Gezer Shava is used to teach that uh, the the Truma of a Toda, of a Toda offering, like the, the Truma's Meiser, consists of one-tenth of the total. In other words, one loaf of that every 10. When the when Am Yisrael is wandering in the wilderness before they entered the land, Israel did not become obligated in the mitzvah of, of truma or miser or any of the agricultural laws. Okay, they didn't have to separate hala, they didn't have to uh, give peya, they didn't have to worry about alelos, they didn't have to worry about uh, revi, any of this stuff, because they didn't have the land, right? Because it you know, these laws are connected to your land. They didn't possess it yet. The The question now is going to say that, well, wait a second. You know, in Devarim, in in chapter 14, 22, you know, it says that you shall remove Meiser from all the produce of your planting. And the term your planting is going to imply that the obligation doesn't uh, take effect until the land is properly yours, until the land is apportioned and, um, you know, they split up the land. Rashi is going to give a different source for why Truma and Meiser began only after the entry of the land instead of actually 14 years later when they actually finished dividing it. If you take a look in the Rashi in Kiddushin 40b, uh, you can you can see that explanation, but it would look like that this halacha should, should occur after 14 years, not actually like the first day you walk into the land because it wasn't actually apportioned yet. It wasn't all conquered yet. So it had to be conquered and apportioned. So that's that's something that's going to be a little bit vague. Now, here's what's going on. Rosh Cirillo is going to point out that the Toda brought in its proper time requires one of every 10 loaves to be given to the cone. And it stands to reason that an offering that cannot be brought in the proper manner should not be brought at all. And accordingly, without the ability to give the truma of toda, the toda bread itself, the toda can't be brought. And the Rosh Cirillo continues and says that there were no restrictions whatsoever on the types of offerings that could be brought in the wilderness, uh, in the in the tabernacle. Basically, here's here's what Rabbi Bibi is interpreting Rabbi Yuda is saying. Okay, let's just sum this up. He's saying that Rabbi Yuda says that the Gezer Shav of holy of holy, holy and holy has an unlimited comparison of Meiser Shani and Revi'i. And the Gezer Shava teaches not only these rules that relate directly to the sanctity of Meiser Shani and Revi'i, but also those that pertain to matters unconnected to sanctity, such as the locations in which these mitzvahs would take place, like in Syria, right? So the Gemara now is going to argue that this Gezer Shava of Truma Toda and Truma Meiser should also be employed in the same way. And just as you have an unlimited comparison between, you know, two laws over here with um, with the Revi'i and the Truma Meiser, you should also have an unlimited law with Truma 
Toda, the Truma Toda and, and Truma's Meiser. And this unlimited comparison of the two laws, uh, you know, for this Gezerah Shava, you know, can teach, can be used to teach location. And it can be, you know, used to tell us that there was no Toda offering in the wilderness. But in fact, those offerings were actually brought in the wilderness. You can open up the Torah and read it yourself. So it follows that Rabbi Bibi's understanding of Rabbi Yudah's position is perhaps mistaken, or is mistaken, and Rabbi Yudah does not actually mean to say that the Gezer Shava can be employed to teach um, non-intrinsic aspects of a given law, such as location. So keep in mind that Rebbe, who we were talking about with the opinion of Rabbi Zera, what Rabbi Zera was trying to articulate yesterday, He's basically saying uh, that this Gezer Shava, Rebbe is also saying this Gezer Shava uh, can teach non-intrinsic aspects of the law, like the Shemitah exemption. But nevertheless, the Gemara is going to be, you know, directing this question toward Rabbi Yudah and not toward Rebbe. And that's because Rebbe used the Gezer Shava to teach that the time at which the mitzvah is in effect, but not the location. Therefore, Rebbe doesn't come up with this particular challenge because he's not questioning time. Rabbi Yuda is using it to question place, like in Syria. So that's why this challenge comes up, because they're saying, hey, wait a second, how can you make this Gezer Shava? Because you could also just make a Gezer Shava the same way with no, with no limits, also with no limits between... Uh, truma of the Toda bread and the Truma Meiser, and and we we saw that hey they were bringing the the Toda bread uh, in the wilderness. So if you're going to say that it's only linked to location, it can't be because they were also bringing it in the wilderness. So there's a mistake there. The Gemara is gonna is gonna try to defend Rabbi Bivi's explanation, and here's what Rabbi Yossi says. Rabbi Yossi says, with regard to the analogy between Truma Meiser and Truma of Toda, they learn from Truma Meiser only the prescribed amounts of Toda bread are required. And since the analogy was intended for that purpose only, it could not be employed to teach a wilderness exemption for the Truma of Toda. So let's take a look at the Mara Fulda to help us to understand that. He's basically saying that the law of Rebbe'i is mentioned in scripture. However, the details of the practice are not described, but left for the Gezer Shava of the Meister Shini and the Revi'i, which teaches many aspects of the law of Revi'i. And because the Gezer Shava is the source of so much as essential in the practice of Revi'i, Rabbi Yudah felt that it could be employed to also teach the location of this practice. So by contrast, the laws of the Toda offering uh, and its loaves are extensively uh, discussed in scripture, whereas the laws of Rebbe'i are not. So he'd basically be saying that, hey, according to what they're saying, like what Rabbi Yudah would imply, he's saying, look, these are these are extra laws that apply to the Toda offering. So if you took those laws out, you would look at it in terms of coming up with the same system like what you would, you would do for Rebbe'i. And so the laws would look more like Rebbe'i. And the reason that the laws don't look like Rebbe'i here for the Toda offering is because the Torah itself adds all sorts of extra verses to explain all these things and when you should do it and the location. And that's why, so what Rabbi Yudah would counter is to say, hey, that's why they're doing the Rebbe'i offering in the wilderness. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying to yourself, wow, your shami is really intricate and it's really hard. And yes, it is. That's why your Shalmi is not really popular. But nonetheless, you can't change the Gemara. The Gemara is what the Gemara is. And this is the way Rabbi Yochanan put it together. He wants us to go through this and to try to learn about these things so we have a broader understanding. There's a lot of ways of having education. There's a lot of techniques for education. And this is going to be one of those cases where maybe in today's day, we're not used to this kind of education system, but uh, this is this is nonetheless a system that Rabbi Yochanan put in here because we're, we're bumping through all these these things, right? About Toda breads and the laws of Meister Shini in Syria 
and it's forcing us to learn more about the subject, a subject that maybe we weren't that familiar with, by trying to figure out what it is and what it isn't. And uh, without even coming and telling you the correct answer, without even coming and holding your hand and telling you this is the answer and here's why, which is what we're very used to uh, in our learning today, um, they're not doing that. They're making you work through this and toil and toil and toil and by the act of toiling to learn about it. And, the, and so there's a, there's a smartness to this. So, uh, you know, don't give up and don't be sad that you're not getting it because again, this is a, this is a way of learning that you're not used to. So the Gemara is going to get into this Baraisa about Revi'i in which it's going to try to connect Rabbi Yudah's ruling. We're going to talk about how, you know, the settling of the land, which is very interesting. And it says, it was taught in a Baraisa, Rabbi Yose, the son of Rabbi Yudah and Rabbi Lazar, the son of Rabbi Shimon said, Israel did not become obligated in the mitzvah of a, a fourth year sapling until after 14 years from when they entered the land. And that is seven years in which they conquered the land and seven years in which they apportioned it to the tribes. So uh, I just want to point out something by, by the Rosh Cerulea. Although the law of Orla commenced immediately on Israel's entrance into Eretz Yisrael, we know that from Orla, chapter 1, that uh, Revi'i, which is also going to be connected to Orla, because you have to have your three Orla years first, and then the fourth one is going to be, you know, have some sort of Kedusha, and you can't, you have to, you know, you have to go and bring it to Jerusalem to celebrate it there, you know, on one of the holidays of the foot, and eat it over there. And then on the fifth year, you could do whatever you want with the fruit. So uh, this, you know, Revi'i is connected to Orla because Orla has to happen first. So the Rosh Cerulio points out that that did not begin until after the land had been subdued and apportioned to the tribes. Now, the Gemara is going to try to explain this ruling because, um, yeah, I mean, Orla is going to talk about the fruit in the first three years after it's planted. So then how could you have the Revi'i coming up after, after you know, 14 years plus three years of planting? So that's a big question. So let's see. So the Gemara is going to identify the source of the ruling. And Rav Hizda says, the ruling of Rabbi Yose, the son of Rabbi Yudah, follows the view of Rabbi Yudah's father, as explained by Rabbi Bibi. Okay, Gemara continues. It says, just as Rabbi Yudah said that the rabbis derived the law of a fourth-year sapling from none other than the law of Meiser Shini, and he therefore ruled that just as you say there's no requirement of Meiser Shini in Syria, in the same way, says the Gemara, there should be no requirement of a fourth-year sapling in Syria. So this Rabbi Yossi that's talking here is... Rabbi Yose bar Yehuda. It's Rabbi Yose's son. So, um, so let's continue. So basically they're saying, you know, so, you know, in the same way, says the Gemara, there's no requirement for a fourth year sapling in Syria. And so too did Rabbi Yose bar Yehuda say, since the rabbis derived the law of a fourth year sapling from none other than the law of Meister Shini, just, then just as you say that there was no requirement of Meister Shani until after the 14 years of conquest and apportioning of the land to the tribes and the families, in the same way, there was no requirement of the fourth year sapling until after the 14 years of conquest and apportionment. Now, Gamar is not going to like this idea, but let's, let's explain what's just been proposed, okay? So, according to this, Rabbi, Yusa, Rabbi Yudah is expounding the Gezerah Shava of Holy and Holy between Meister Shini and Revi'i to teach that just as there's no Meister Shini in Syria, also there's no Revi'i in Syria. Now, keep in mind that regarding the Toda bread, there's all sorts of extra pasukim to give us extra rules about when to do it, where to do it, right? Because it, we know that they did the Toda bread in the wilderness because the Torah says so, and it says to do it. Rabbi Yudah is saying, well, we don't have any rules like that for 
for Rebbe E at all. And the only way we could describe and figure out what to do with the law would be to use a, a Gezer Shava between here and here to tell us what to do with with uh, the thing that's closest to it, Meiser Shini. And just like Meiser Shini over here has no Meiser Shini in Syria, by the way, also no Meiser Shini in Shemitah, so too you would have no Meiser Shini, no Revi'i in Syria. So that's why Rabbi Yuda could say, hey, that's why Bet Shemai is talking about uh, the Revi'i occurring in the Shemitah year. Why could it be? Because because we don't have extra pasukim in the Torah to tell us. So we have to use this Gezer Shava to the thing that's most closely linked to it, uh, according to this one reading. Now, there's another reading that links it to Bikurim, but that's not what they're focused on. They're focused on this one. So, so uh, you know, the, the, other, the other point here is that, is that, this Gezer Shava is going to teach that just as this requirement of Meister Shini did not go effect, into effect until after Eretz Yisrael was subdued and the land gets divided. So after 14 years, so too with regard to the requirement of Rebbe'i, um, that you know, just like Meister Shini didn't go into effect uh, until after the 14 years, same too with Rebbe'i, and it did not commence until after the 14 years of conquering and apportionment to the tribes and the families. So that brings up a big question. Well, what about, what about what's going on with Orla? What about other issues about Kedusha? What happens if you have something that happens in the fifth year uh, of conquering the land? So the Gemara is going to reject this idea. And Rabbi Yose said, to the contrary, logic dictates that Rabbi Yudah's ruling follows the view of his son rather than the reverse. So, this is a, another Rabbi Yossi talking about the Rabbi Yossi who's the son of Rabbi Yuda. Okay, that's a lot of Rabbi Yossi's here. So this is a Rabbi Yossi commenting on a Rabbi Yossi, literally. Okay, so I'll read it again. And Gemara is going to reject the idea that we just talked about. So Rabbi Yossi says, to the contrary, logic dictates that Rabbi Yuda's ruling follows the view of his son, Rabbi Yossi, rather than the reverse. So for this exemption of Rebbe'i in Syria can be derived from its exemption. I'm talking about the Rabbi Yossi commenting on the son of Rabbi Yudah, right? Rabbi Yossi, um, who's not related to Rabbi Yudah, is saying the following. He says, for the exemption of Rebbe'i in Syria can be derived from its exemption during the 14 years of conquest and apportionment, but the exemption of Rebbe'i during the 14 years could not be derived from its exemption in Syria. So let's try to explain this with the help of the Mara Fulda. So here's what it says. It says, there are numerous laws that are applicable in Eretz Israel during the 14 years that do not apply in Syria. And it follows that the law of the 14 years is more stringent than that of Syria. And according to the fact that the Gezer Shava teaches that there is no Revi'i in Syria, does not definitively demonstrate that it can be used also to teach that there's no Revi'i during the 14 years. Because one could argue that with regard to Revi'i 2, the law of 14 years is more stringent than that of Syrian. By contrast, says Amaro Fulda, the Gezerah Shava is teaching us that there is no Revi'i during the 14 years, which it certainly can be used to teach that there would be no Revi'i in Syria, whose law is less stringent than that of the 14 years. And if anything, it is Rabbi Yuda who follows the view of his son, not the reverse. Now, I want to point out something from uh, the Vilna Gon, and he's saying that, you know, logic says that the earlier event is the source of the later and not the reverse. And since the 14 years of conquest and apportionment preceded the conquest of Syria by many years, it is, uh, it is more likely than uh, that the law of Syria was derived from the law of the 14 years rather than the other way around. So the Gemara now is going to try to, you know, connect this ruling of Rabbi Yudah. And the Gemara says like this, it says, it is written following the verse that teaches the law of a fourth year sapling. And in the fifth year, you shall eat its fruit to add for you its produce. 
So go look in Leviticus 19, chapter 19, line 25, and basically it's saying that the verse is going to represent a promise of abundance and plenty to those who observe the laws of Orla and Revi'i, and it's going to basically add to the produce that you would get if you're going to if you're going to observe it as this reward for observing it. You're going to you're going to see an extra increase in the in the produce, and that's what where it's saying, you know, where the Torah is saying added to. It's going to be like you're going to get this produce. Torah is going to guarantee it, and you're going to get this extra produce if you follow these laws. And the Brisa now is going to is going to get into a, a, a different, you know, give this verse a little bit different meaning to try to to do it. But that's that's the verse that we're talking about. It's going to be in Leviticus 19, verse 25. So Gemara is going to is going to get into it and it says it is written following the verse that teaches the law of the fourth year sapling, and it says, and in the fifth year you shall eat its fruit to add for you its produce. And Rabbi Yosei Haglili says, in expounding the phrase to add for you, he says, behold, it is as if you are adding the fruit of the fifth year to the fruit of the fourth year. And just as the fruit of the fifth year is a property of the owner, so too the fr fruit of the fourth year is a property of the owner and not the divine. Now this is going to get into an argument between Rabbi Yuda and um, and and Rabbi Meir. And Rabbi Meir is going to be saying that Meister Shini is the property of the divine. And Rabbi Yuda is going to be saying that Meister Shini is the property of the person. Um, the question is going to be, well, what does Bet Shammai say? Does Bet Shammai say it's going to be like Rabbi Yuda, or does Bet Shammai say it's going to be like Rabbi Meir? That's that's really unclear. I don't know that. But from other Gemaras in the Shas, it does say all over the place this argument between Rabbi Yudah and Rabbi Meir. Is this going to have sanctity because it's property of the divine? Or is it going to have sanctity but it belongs to you to use? It's unclear. Um, I, by the way, personally am attracted to the opinion of Rabbi Meir. That might not be the halacha, but I think it's a, a beautiful idea. So uh, the, the question now is they're going to try to get into, well, just like you have, you have um, Meister Shini could belong to the property of the divine, uh, so too maybe the fourth year produce has, is also the property of the divine. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's the property of the owner, but it has some sanctity. So they're going to now be trying to bring the other parts of Meister Shini into Revi'i. So they're going to, you know, the most obvious, uh, obvious one is going to be like, does this, okay, it has sanctity, fine, and you have possession of it, you get to use it, but just like Maestro Shani, does that belong to Hashem or or it's yours? Are you allowed to make an acquisition for it? Are you allowed to make a Kenyan for it? Can you acquire a wife with it? What's what's going on? How You know, so Mara Fulda is going to say like this, Rabbi Yosei HaGalili, uh, is is using the words to add from the Torah in Leviticus 19.25, where it's saying, hey, if you're going to follow the laws of Orla and Revi'i, the fruit trees are going to add extra produce. Hashem's going to add extra produce for following the laws. And that's going to indicate this connection between the fruits of the fifth year and those of the fourth year. That's how Rabbi Yosef Galili is interpreting it. He's saying that this to add is really connecting the fourth year fruit and fifth year fruit with this common characteristic being that both are regarded as property of the owner. And that tells us that just as Revi'i has sanctity and must be taken to Jerusalem and redeemed, in other ways it is regarded as the owner's private property. For example, if he wishes to use the Revi'i fruit to, to get married to a woman, he, he would be able to because you know the money is considered to be his own and that betrothal would take effect. But if it's a property of the divine, you're not allowed to go and acquire a wife with it because it's not yours. You can't you can't acquire something with something that's not yours. And the Gemara now is going to point out that you know the view of Rabbi uh, Yose HaGalili is actually going to be shared by Rabbi Yuda. Rabbi Zera said in the name of Rabbi Yasu said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan 
Rabbi Yosei HaGalili is in accordance with the view of Rabbi Yuda, so there's no going to be no disagreement about Rabbi uh, Rabbi Yosei HaGalili's point. And the Gemara continues says, just as Rabbi Yuda considers fourth year fruits to be the owner's property, so too does Rabbi Yosei HaGalili consider fourth year fruits to be the owner's property. In other words, uh, you would be able to um, go make a uh, you'd be able to go make a you know, a wedding with it. You'd be able to, to give it to a bride and it would count. So Rabbi Yuda doesn't say anywhere that Rebbe E is a property owner, okay? But by saying that Meister Shani is the owner's property, okay, uh, he and he's using this Kazer Shava between Meister Shani and Rebbe E, uh, like what we were just seeing with Rabbi Bivi, this Gezerah Shava is going to tell us that just as Meister Shini is considered to be the owner's personal property, according to, to some opinions, so too Rebbe E uh, would also be personal property. So basically they're saying, says Amara Fulda, it emerges that Rabbi Yossi, um, the Galilean from Galilee, and Rabbi Yuda are in agreement as to the ownership of Rebbe E, but for different reasons. So this, again, is not at all going to be the opinion of, of Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir is going to hold that this is the property of the divine and that it's not your property and you can't marry a woman with it. So having mentioned Rabbi Yuda holds that Rabbi E is the property of the owner, okay, the Gemara now is going to, is going to ask about this view. So Rabbi Yermia inquired before Rabbi Zera, according to the one who considers fourth-year fruit, to be the owner's property and not the property of the divine, um, what is the law with regard to whether such fruit is subject to the law of, of Meiser? So let's let's take a look at the Mara Fulda to help us understand that. If, he's basically explaining it like this. He says, if Rebbe is the property of the divine, it is like any other consecrated produce, and it is certainly not subject to the laws of Meiser. Why? Because once you consecrate produce, right, and it belongs to the temple or belongs to heaven, you, you're not allowed to, to, to take out tithes from it, okay? Because how can you tithe something that belongs to heaven? So just like you couldn't, if the, if the Revi'i and the Miser were going to be property of the divine, then you're not allowed, it's not subject to the laws of Miser, you're not allowed to, to remove tithes from it. But if the Revi'i is going to be personal property of the landowner, um, then in a lot of respects, even though it has some sanctity, it is unconsecrated produce, and uh, then it should be subject to the laws of Meiser. Now, an example of that would be that um, if you take out, you know, Truma Godola, okay, that has some sanctity, but it's not consecrated to the temple, okay, it's not consecrated to heaven, you have to give it to the cone, and then Let's say the the levy comes and takes out tithes. Well, he has to take out a tithe from his part and give it to the cone, right? But that also has sanctity and is required to do. But even though he's taking out, you know, has something that has sanctity, he's taking out tithes from something that has sanctity. The levy levy is taking out tithes from that, but um, it it's not consecrated now. If in any of these cases it were consecrated and it belonged to the divine, then nobody could take out tithes, not the Kohen, not the Levi, not anybody. So over here, it basically would be saying that um, if the, you know, you know, if the, the Rebbe and the, and the Miser would be uh, unconsecrated, even if it has some Kedusha, that you would have to take out Truma and Meiser from the Revi'i before you ate it, okay, if that's the case. If it's going to be like Rabbi Yuda and, and the person owns it, you have to put out tithes. Yes, it has some sanctity, but you still have to take tithes on it. It's Just think of it like, you know, the lady, you know, took out uh, tithes and he has to take out, you know, a tithe for the, for the, uh, for the cone. So, so, um, okay, so... That's, um, that's, uh, or even he received tithes, right? So he received the Miser from, uh, from Am Yisrael 
And now he has to take the tithes out. The lady has to take out tithes and give it to the cone. Okay, that's what it would be like. What he received has sanctity, um, but he doesn't have the same laws about it, you know, stopping it from becoming tame. But, okay, but he still has to take it out. It has some sort of kadusha to it. Okay, so the, the, the Gemara is going to now continue and it's gonna it's gonna get into you know Rabbi Zera's inquiry, okay? So Rabbi Zera responds, okay, whether you know this Rebbe E is gonna be subject to the law of Meiser, okay? And he said to Rabbi Yermia, it is like that which is stated by Rabbi Yeshua Bain Levi in another context, for Rabbi Avin said in the name of Rabbi Yeshua Bain Levi. Not only this halacha, but any halacha regarding which the court wavers, and you do not know its correct practice, go out and see how the community conducts itself and conduct yourself accordingly. In other words, they're saying that, hey, Am Yisrael are not prophets, but they're the sons of prophets, and uh, as a whole, go look at how the whole community is acting in terms of this observance, and that will show you what we should be doing, that that will help to show us. So Rabbi Zera is going to conclude, and we see that the community does not separate Miser from the fruit of Rebbe'i. So they're saying, well, Rabbi Zera is pointing out, well, if you're going to go do what Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi did, said, which is that, hey, if you're not sure, go look at how the community is doing it. Rabbi Zera is coming and saying, well, the community doesn't separate Meiser from the fruit of Revi'i, and therefore Revi'i is not subject to the law of Meiser. So that is going to be a big surprise. But the Gemara is going to reject that approach. Rabbi Mana said, if Rabbi Yermia, in his inquiry, would have stated according to Bet Shemai, it would be clear that Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi's rule is without relevance here. For is there a community that acts in accordance with the rulings of Bet Shemai? Of course not, right? So just as a as a, a comment on this and some help from the Mara Fulda, so yeah, Rabbi Yermia is discussing the view of Rabbi Yudah, not not the law or the rule of Bet Shemai. And you know, this reasoning same reasoning applies. Rabbi Yudah's view is identical uh, you know. If, if that were to be true, then Rabbi Yudah's view would be identical to Bet Shemai. And since the community rejects that view, their actions really don't reveal anything about Rabbi Yudah's ruling. So um, so that that's a that's a big question. In other words, says says the Mara Fulda, the the question of whether Rebbe E belongs to the owner or the divine is a matter of a dispute between Bet Hillel and Bet Shemai. And we see in the second part of this Mishnah where they debate whether Reva'i is going to be subject to Peret and Olios. And since it is Bet Shemai who says that Reva'i is the property of the landowner, uh, the conduct of the community can tell us nothing about whether uh, the view uh, obligates Reva'i in Miser, because the community is going to follow the ruling of Bet Hillel. So they're going to basically be saying that, yeah, of course, Bet Hillel says it's the property of the divine. Of course they're going to be following, you know. Of course they're going to be following uh, the view of Bet Hillel. There's no community that follows the view of Bet Shemai. So the Gemara is going to resolve this question, and Rabbi Avin says like this: Gemara says, "Did they learn that the fruit of the fourth year sapling is the property of the owner from anywhere other than Meiser Shini? They did not, for Meiser Shini is indeed the source of the law." So Mar continues, says, accordingly, just as you say that Meiser Shini is not subject to the law of Meiser, even though it is a property owner, in the same way, the fruit of a fourth year sapling is subject to the law of Meiser, even though it is a property of the owner. So Rosh Cerilio is going to say that, you know, one might ask, Meiser Shini is the final tithe taken from one's produce and has already had Meiser taken from it. Why then does the Gemara say that it is not subject to the Meiser requirement. And it continues, and it says that a possible answer is that the Gemara refers to Meiser that was taken out of sequence before the other tithes, 
Although it never had mice or taken from it, it is still exempt. This, however, uh, is going to be a strained uh, interpretation of the Gemara. Uh, Hazanish says in in Demai chapter four in his commentary on Demai chapter twenty uh, four uh, Halacha twenty four, which states that uh, the the comparison between Revi'i and Meiser that was separated in accordance with the mitzvah. Uh, um, and and it's going to be uh, you know not correct you know if they separated it incorrectly. In other words, if you're taking it out of sequence, says the Chazanish, that uh, it's it's not it's uh, it's going to be problematic and and not valid. So so the, the this question comes up, and we're we're going to just finish it up real quick. And finish up the the sugya. So we have this question about whether Maishishini is a property of the owner of the divine. Uh, and now the the Gemara is gonna is gonna make a dispute about this question. Okay. So what we were just reading is we could we could look at it under some interpretations that perhaps we were looking at the law of Maishishini that was separated out the Gemara is referring to when they separated out of order but uh, that that could be a problematic interpretation um, and you know if you know Meister Shani is going to be eaten uh, then you know just like it is right if you're just going to eat the Meister Shani just like it is you have a bunch of dates and you're just going to eat them okay right now then you know no Meister has to be taken from it before eating it, because Zereshava would teach the same as true of Revi'i. But, you know, the question, you know, then you have this question of, well, you know, if Meister Shani is a final tithe taken from one's produce and, you know, already had Meister taken from it, you know, why does the Gemara say that it's not subject to the Meister requirement? So this, this is, you know, getting into this question of, well, you know, maybe it's because it's taken out of order, but that's, that's really hard to understand. Rabbi Ba says in the name of Rabbi Chia, who said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, regarding a doe of Meister Shini in Jerusalem, according to Rabbi Meir, it is exempt from the requirement of Hala because it is the property of the divine. And according to Rabbi Yuda, it is a subject of uh, subject to the requirement of Hala because it is the property of the owner. So now we're getting to this other agricultural law, Hala, which also you know comes in you know, with the laws of the land. And now they're, you know, also saying, well, what about this one? Is this going to be your property too? Or is this also the property of the divine? Rabbi Meir says property of the divine. Rabbi Yuda says, no, your property has some sanctity, but still your property. So Maro Fulda says, you know, as we saw um, before, Rabbi Yuda rules that, you know, Meister Shini belongs to the person, not the divine. And it follows that a dough made of Meister Shini is going to be regarded as your dough, and therefore it is subject to the law of Hala. So, uh, you know, we have, by the way, there's an obligation. You have to remove part of the dough made out of wheat, barley, oats, spelt rye, give it to a cone. Okay? And, you know, that has to do with if you're doing it out of, you know, 43.2 eggs, and then you take out, you know, you separate, you know, a, a portion of it. Okay. So, the Gemara is saying that Rabbi Meir says that the dough of Meister Shini is exempt from the requirement of Hala because that is the property of the divine. You can't take out tithes on something that is the property of the divine. So um, he's going to basically be saying that, you know, the verse that commands the obligation of Hala says your dough. And he's saying that that implies that the obligation, you know, means that the dough belongs to the person. And that would exclude Meister Shani because that doesn't belong to a person. It belongs to a Shem. And Rabbi Yudah is saying, no, uh, he's saying that your dough, uh, you know, that Meister Shani is your dough and that it belongs to you and you can take it out because it hasn't been consecrated. There would be no disagreement, by the way, between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yudah if something was consecrated. Everybody agrees this is consecrated. And then, yeah, you can't take out tithes. No dispute about that. What they're disputing is, hey, if you have if you have dough of Meister Shani and you want to make challah out of it and you take out the challah, 
uh, does that have sanctity or not? Uh, not sanctity. Does that is that valid hala or not? So Rabbi Meir would say that's not valid hala. You can't make the bracha on it because that's not your dough. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the divine. And and Rabbi Yudah is saying yes, you can. The the Meisher Shani is not property of the divine. Has some sanctity, but it's not it's not property of the divine. It's your property, and you can take out you know ties on your property. On yeah, so. So the Gemara is going to elaborate. Rabbi Yonah said uh, they stated this dispute only when Meister Shani Do is located in Jerusalem, and they said that in the case, Rabbi, you know, in that case, Rabbi Yuda rules that the Do is subject to the requirement of Chala, but when it is located in the provinces outside of Jerusalem, uh, there's no dispute by anybody, and in that case, even Rabbi Yuda agrees that the Do is not subject to Chala. So. Rabbi Yona is is clarifying that that um, if if it's in Jerusalem, this this case applies. But everybody agrees, even Rabbi Rabbi uh, Yuda, that you know if it's up in Tiberias and you want to separate Hala on Meister Shani, it's not subject to Hala. Uh, so you know there's there's two interpretations for why Rabbi Yuda you, you know could agree. Uh, that outside of Jerusalem, the Meister Shani is not subject to Hala. So Mara Fulda is going to give uh, one of the explanations. He says that Meister Shani may not be eaten outside of Jerusalem unless it's redeemed, because the owner does not have the right to eat Meister Shani in its present state or location, like in Tiberias, for example. Then even Rabbi Yuda must admit that it is not considered his property, but the property of the divine, and there's, therefore is not subject to the requirement of hala. By the way, you can find that also echoed by Rashi in Sanhedrin 112b. Um, the second explanation is that, you know, even outside of Jerusalem, the Rosh Cerulio explains this uh, second one. Rashi gives also the second explanation in, uh, in Kiddushin 53b. You can also see the toast quote for that. The Rosh Cerulio explains that for the second opinion, alternatively, even outside of Jerusalem, Rabbi Yudah regards the dough as a property of the owner and not the divine, and nevertheless, he admits that it is subject to hala, and this is because the Meister Shani at the moment is made into dough, and it made and sorry at the moment uh, it's made into dough. It may not be eaten since it has not been redeemed, and it is forbidden for consumption at that moment. And it cannot be considered your dough. So uh, if you're taking the Meister Shini, the Meister Shini has to be eaten in Jerusalem. And basically, with a second interpretation, Rabbi Yudah would be pointing out that, well, you you added water and flour to prepare this this dough now. And you're preparing this dough in Meister in, in Tiberias. You're not allowed to do that. The rule in the Torah says you have to bring it to, to, eat, to, to where the temple is to eat it. You have to bring it to Jerusalem. So you did it. In the wrong place, so so of course it's not subject to hala because you're not allowed to to prepare meiser shani for eating in Tiberias. It has to be in Jerusalem, of course. Of course, it's not subject. That's basically what the second opinion of what Rabbi Yuda is saying. Rabbi Yuda is saying you did meiser shani in the wrong place at the wrong time. Of course, it's not subject. So Gemara is going to present a question. And then it's going to finish with a big question, a big surprise. So the Gemara is going to present this question. Rabbi Bob Bar Cohen inquired for Rabbi Yosi, according to one who rules that the fruit of a fourth year vineyard is subject to the law of Peret, that, by the way, is going to be Bet Shemai, what is the law with regard to whether it should be subject to the law of Hala? In other words, they're asking, how does, how does Bet Shemai actually rule on this? Um, okay, we know... We know how they rule for fourth year vineyard, and we know about for parrot, no problem. But what about what about challah? How does how exactly are they going to be ruling on this on uh, on challah? So, um, so let's let's take a look at the Pnei Moshe, and it says, you know, are are Revi'i fruits going to be subject to the law of challah or not? And uh, here's what it says. It says an obvious difficulty is that the hala obligation applies only to grain, whereas the law of parrot is grapes. So how can grapes be subject to the requirement of hala? And the Sefer Nier explains that the inquiry 
concerns a case in which the grapes were redeemed with money that was used in Jerusalem to purchase grain, where the grain uh, acquired the sanctity of Revi'i, and the, now the Gemara is going to question whether or not Kala must be taken from dough made with the grain. So, so here's the case, okay? Somebody comes in Tiberius, they deconsecrate their Revi'i grapes because they don't want it to spoil, you know, the holidays coming up in a couple of months, they can't get the grapes there on time, they deconsecrate it. No problem. Everybody agrees you can deconsecrate it. You put it onto the coins. Great. Now it has the sanctity, because it has Revi'i, everybody agrees, has some sanctity, and now you bring it to Jerusalem. Okay, great. Everybody agrees you got to bring it to Jerusalem. No problem. What did you do with that money? You bought grain. You bought wheat. And now you're making challah out of it. Now you've transferred the sanctity of the Revi'i onto this grain, even before you made challah. What do you do? And what would be the law with regard to whether it's going to be subject to challah or not? Very good question. And by the way, I could totally see lots of people doing that. Would you have to take out challah for that or not? Is that going to be property of the divine or not? The Rabbi Yossi is going to respond to this question. He said to Rabbi Bar Barkon, which by the, by the way I think is an excellent question, and here's how the Gemara reads. It says, but it is not Rabbi Yuda who rules that Meister Shani and Revi'i is subject to challah. Of course it is. And therefore... It would stand to reason that Bet Shemai too must take this view. In other words, trying to figure out, well, how does Bet Shemai rule about the the um, the hollow, right? If you're if you have something that has sanctity on it, right? Do you are you allowed to take out hollow from it or not? Is it going to go by Rabbi Meir, who says you can't, or is it going to go by Rabbi Yudu, who says you can, right? Let's say you have the Meister Shini and you want to take out. The, the hala. Can you do it or not? And they're saying, look, if you deconsecrated these coins and you put it, uh, which came from grapes, and you bought this grain and now you're in the walls, you want to make hala, you're allowed to take out hala or not. The so Gemara continues. And so Rabbi, uh, this, this Yo Rabbi Yossi response is basically saying it must be that, that Bet Shemai also takes this opinion that you know, yeah, it would be subject to Hala, and Rabbi Yuda must be must be in agreement with with Bet Shemai, or Bet Shemai would agree with with Rabbi Yuda. Gemara continues says, for throughout the Gemara's discussion, we assumed that uh, every one of the rulings that Rabbi Yuda follows the view of Rabbi Shemai, which you know, who is basically deriving the law of Revi'i from from. Uh, Meister Shini, Rebbe also does, by the way, but they have a difference in, you know, time and place. So, you know, if basically they're saying that, you know, if Rabbi Yuda holds the same, you know, that, hey, Rebbe E, you know, would, would be subject, just like Meister Shini would be subject to Hala, so, you know, Bet Shemai must hold that, that way too. But hold on a second. So that actually... Um, might not really be the case because um, we're trying to make this assumption that Rabbi Yudah's rulings represent this view of, of Bet Shemai, but wait a second, Bet Shemai must hold that Meister Shini is subject to the obligation of Hala, and that Gezer Shava would teach that the same would be the true of Revi'i as well. So there would be no problem with what Rabbi uh, Bob Arcon just asked, but here's the problem, okay? The Gemara is suggesting that Bet Shemai's view is identical with Rabbi Yudah. And the Gemara responds that uh, there's no reason to assume that because Bet Shemai could very well hold like Rabbi Meir and that the Meister Shini is not subject to Hala. According to this interpretation, uh, the Gemara would be actually unresolved. And the problem is here is that we don't know what the view of Bet Shemai actually is. We're not sure how they derive uh, Revi'i exactly. And if you're going to read it like this, where if if um, Bet Shemai is actually going to rule like Rabbi Meir, that the, the Meister Shini is not going to be subject to Hala, then, then this just ends the whole, the whole Halaha 
unresolved, and we don't know. We don't anyway. We we just don't know what uh, Rabbi what Bet Shemai actually ended up ruling. Now we know from the Bobli that it went by uh, Rabbi Yuda. Fine, but if you're going to read it like this, um, it it could be that Bet Shemai. Uh, if they held like if if they hold if Bet Shemai holds like Rabbi Yuda, there's no problem, okay? But we're not told what Bet Shemai holds on you know Meister Shani, uh, whether it's you know whether it's going to be you know subject to Hala or not. And Rabbi Meir holds that Meister Shani is not subject to Hala. And if Rabbi Yuda, if if Bet Shemai is also going to be holding that because. Um, by saying that that um, you know it's going to be similar to Rabbi Meir's opinion, even though it, it might not be exact, but the but the main point is the same, which is that you know the Meister Shini uh, you can't take out Hala from Meister Shini, so if you can't take it out, you also can't take it out from the deconsecrated coins from the Rebbe, and so you would just you would end up with the unresolved halacha. Um, here's the point. Okay, here's the point. Point is. You can't change the Gemara. Gemara is what it is. It just is what it is, okay? And now we have to step back and say, okay, why did we go through this? What what was this all about? Rabbi Yuda, I'm sorry, not Rabbi Yuda. Rabbi Yochanan organized this for us, okay? This is the, this is the dish he served us, okay? We can't change it. This is what he gave us. He might have just given us an unresolved sugya that we worked three days on, okay? That That might be. Okay, we're not exactly sure Bet Shemai's opinion. If Bet Shemai's opinion was by like Rabbi Yuda, then okay, that gets resolved, but we're not told what Bet Shemai's opinion is. It could have been like Rabbi Meir, in which case it's not resolved. We didn't we didn't resolve it. And so the the point is that that's also not accidental. That's also not an accident. That's being done to sharpen your mind. In a way, you know, Rabbi Yochanan saying, yeah, I care what Bet Shemai says. And in a way, he says, I kind of don't care what Bet Shemai says because I'm going to go through and force you in this possibly, quite possibly, unresolved, unresolvable uh, puzzle to go through and figure it out. But you're not going to get the answer either. And not only are you not going to get the answer, but in fact, while you're toiling to go through it, you're going to learn a lot. And that is the point of what we just did for three days. Now, if you really go through these three hours, you're going to really learn a lot about Revi'i. And you're really going to get a lot of details about how this thing functions in a deep, rich way. And that is the point of why Rabbi Yochanan very well could have given the cases of these sugyas that end with an unresolvable question. And so many people sitting there struggling over what Bet Shemai was actually saying, we're not really sure. But the Gemaras can't be changed. They're there for a reason. And yes, the Yershalmi is notoriously hard. And part of what makes it hard is it's written and constructed with puzzles. Rabbi Yochanan refers to it in the Shas that they put puzzles in there to sharpen the student's mind. And that is the point.